So, Lord, it's a big deal. Please help me get it right. And really, the reason I was asking Haley to put 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 14 is, is that uh, I'm, I'm starting my message off kind of with a question. And so it says here, uh, and he's quoting the Old Testament, the eye, but it is written that the eye hasn't seen, the ear hasn't heard, and hasn't entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Amen. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. Yeah. For the spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. And for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of that man. So what, so what the Holy Spirit's saying is, is that really and truly nobody knows the deep thoughts and the deep intents in each individual's heart or in their mind. Nobody but the spirit of that individual really knows what's going on in there. I mean, we want to believe good of other people, right? But it's the spirit inside of a man that knows. And so similarly, no man really knows the things of God, but the spirit of God. Then it goes on to say this in verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but instead we have received the spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So it's a beautiful picture if you imagine it the proper way that the Holy Spirit, see the plan of salvation says that whenever you hear the good news of Jesus, amen, and you receive him by faith, him and his sacrifice, the Bible teaches real quick like that the old man that was born of Adam dies with Jesus, is buried with Jesus in the tomb, and a new man is resurrected to newness of life. And now in the midst of all of that, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you and in, on the inside of, of myself. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 says that our spirit becomes one with his spirit. Jesus told the Samaritan woman there's coming a day when those that are going to worship him must worship him in spirit yeah. and in truth. That's a powerful truth. Yeah. Amen. That when you and I receive salvation, when you and I receive the Holy Spirit, that the mind of God now lives on the inside of us. Hallelujah. And if we'll learn how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, we will begin to gain great revelation from the Holy Spirit, amen, about what he's doing on the earth, about what he wants to do in our life, about our everyday situations and circumstances, about how we should treat our husbands or our wives, about our marriages, about our children, about our grandchildren, about the world that we live in, how we should handle things at the job, how, should we, how we should handle things about the church that we go to. There's a lot of important things in life that we have to seek God about if we're Christians, yes. right? If we're believers and we believe that the Holy Spirit has something to say to us. Amen. So that's my starting question. In everyday life situations, how do we go about comparing spiritual things with spiritual things? Because look at if you look at verse 13, I, I don't think I received, I didn't read that part. Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Let, let, let me just say that one more time. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Amen? But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, I just want to say something. You know, the natural man describes a person that <laughs> he really is describing a person that's not born again on the, on the front end. It, we should understand that because if you've never been born again and the Holy Spirit doesn't live in you, you're just operating according to the natural mindset. But I got to tell you, and I've said this before, not that long ago, even if you're born again, instead of listening to the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, you can instead listen to your natural man. Amen. You can listen to your own mindsets. You can listen to other voices, Lord help us, right? And, 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 and listen, if we open up the doorway to sin, I'm, I'm getting into sin early this morning. Uh, it's written later, but let's go ahead. If we open up the door to sin, then we cause all kinds of confusion to our walk and to the decision making that we would, because he's saying that we, we compare spiritual things to 
spiritual things. Amen. You can go to one more verse for me real quick. So this is the question. In everyday life situations, how do we go about comparing spiritual things with spiritual things? It's kind of a rhetorical question, but if anybody wants to shout something out, how would you compare spiritual things to spiritual things? How would you compare that? Would you, would you compare the thing that you're going through to what the Holy Spirit would say to you? And the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you. Is, is, listen, is everything spiritual? I, I believe that it is, yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Right? If I, oh, oh, so you're trying to tell me it's spiritual for me to be able to pay my, pay my electric bill. Yeah. yeah. There's a whole lot of spiritual stuff. Because, see, if your mindset is that you just need somebody to bless you with the money to pay your spiritual, to pay your electric bill, but you, but you haven't been working the way you were supposed to work or you haven't been spending your money the way that you were supposed to spend your money. There, like, there's a whole lot of different scenarios of what I'm trying to say. And when you get to the root of it, many times the underlying problem is really spiritual. And so what I'm trying to say to you is how would you compare something spiritual to something spiritual other than the Holy Spirit would be speaking to you? But then in addition to that, how does the Holy Spirit speak? The Word of God. The Word of God. How will we know if what we're hearing is the Spirit of God or if it's the voice of something else if we do not know the Word of God? Hallelujah. And, and when we can, while we're getting started here, can we all agree to, to agree that each and every one of us in this room have varying levels of biblical understanding? Yeah, that's right. Amen. Because all of us are at different levels of our the years that we've studied, the time that we put in. It doesn't mean that just because you put in more time that you have more biblical knowledge than the next guy. Because some people may, you get the point that I'm trying to make though. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that the word of God is the basis upon which the Holy Spirit wants to speak because we can all have opinions. I've been saying that a lot lately because it's just true. We can all have opinions, but it doesn't mean that our opinions are always exactly right. Because what we need to know is, is that our opinions and our spiritual mindsets are compared to spiritual things. And the spiritual things is the word of the Lord. Matter of fact, you could really say that the only there's not that many spiritual things on earth. The word of God, the people of God, and the Holy Spirit inside the people of God. Hallelujah. And everything that we do, it should flow out of that. Now, if you would go to Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. This is really one, one verse that I wanted you to. Uh, to, to see, and this is kind of like where part of my message is coming from. I will, I will say this though, that in that song that y'all that they sang, I don't have y'all ever sang that song about Yahweh before? I can't no. Yeah, new song, which is interesting to me because a lot, even though I almost named my title something to do with the name of God, but I didn't, because in this particular passage of scripture that I'm about to read to you, as I read it over and over again out of the Psalm chapter 20, the name of God, and I actually put some things about the name of God in my message, because the name of God kept really focusing. My, my message has multiple concepts and ideas to it, but I got to tell you that one of the most encouraging things about it is for us to remember the name of, the, of God, to remember the God that we serve, to remember that we are a people upon the earth that are here to give him glory and to, and to exalt him. That, that's why it's so beautiful whenever you see young people or any of us worshiping the Lord. And look, you don't have to come to the altar to worship him, but as long as we're worshiping him. That's why was so encouraging to hear Sabrina say what she said and to hear Miss Matilda say what she said because the Holy Spirit did show up this morning. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like it was taking a little while for us to for us to get in there. Hallelujah. But he showed up. And when he shows up, that's a that's a privilege, church. Yeah. It's a privilege for us to be able to experience the presence of the living God. Yeah. Uh, he wants us to exalt him. He want, and he wants to inhabit the praises of his people. Yes. Yes. And sometimes, listen, you don't feel like exalting him. Yes. Sometimes you don't feel like worshiping him. Because you're tired and you're burdened and you're heavy laden. But listen, I'm not saying this to be mean. I'm just trying to make it real. There's a whole lot of people that have been burdened. That's right. There's a whole lot of people that have been heavy laden. There's a whole lot of people that have been down. There's a whole lot of people that the enemy is trying to cast the spirit of heaviness upon them. But the word of the Lord says that he's giving you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You can worship him even in spite. And if you'll continue to worship 
him. I'm telling you, he wants to show up and he wants to change the atmosphere and he wants to minister in you and through you and to you. Amen. Yeah. Psalm chapter 20, verse 1. I'm sorry, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. David's about to go to battle. David is about to go to battle, and before he goes, he does a wise thing. You know what he does? He stops at the sanctuary, he calls the congregation, and he says, let us go to the Lord, congregation. Let us go to the Lord, all ye people that belong to him. Let us praise his holy name. Because we need him. It's important, Lord. And I need to hear your will on this. I need to hear your voice on this. I need you to go before me in the battle. Whatever it is that I'm going through. Whatever it is that I'm facing. Whether I'm young or I'm old. I need you with me, God. And so he goes to the congregation and he says that. He says, listen. Some trust in chariots. Some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Look at verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend you. You know what's so beautiful about that? L listen, there, you, you got to read your Bible to really be able to catch it. But I just got to tell you something. Jacob, God knew Jacob was in a bind before, before Jacob knew he was in a bind. Jacob's over there hauling all of his family back to go where the Lord lead him to go. He don't even know that Esau's on his trail. Long before Jacob ever knew that he was in trouble, the God of Jacob was there to defend him. The God that you serve is omniscient. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what you're going to go through. And the God of Jacob wants to defend you. Amen. Look what it says next. It says in verse 2, send thee help from the sanctuary. You know, that is where strengthen you out of Zion. You know what Zion is? It's the hill upon which the temple mount was built. The sanctuary is the place where God's presence dwells. Within the sanctuary, beyond the veil, was the mercy seat where the Holy Spirit dwelt, where the glory of God dwelt. The king says, send your presence out of your sanctuary and help your people. He's calling on the presence of the Lord to show up because David has seen God give victory. Now, I want you to see this part right here. Look at verse 3. Remember all thy offerings. He's asking the Lord to remember your offerings. Remember the burnt sacrifices. Listen, I want you to know something that God sees it when we worship him. Don't, listen, come on. Help me, Lord. Help me to say it right. Don't come up in this place thinking that you, that is so bad that you still can't worship the king, my friend, because he takes note, and I'm not saying this to be in the wrong way. I'm saying this to encourage you to know that he takes note. He knows what you're going through. He knows times are tough. He knows things are bad and that you're in the midst of the battle, but he's taking note. And are you earning something? No, but he's remembering. Oh, there she goes. She's calling on me because she needs me. She's asking me to send my spirit out from my sanctuary to help her. She's been worshiping me. She's been spending time in my presence. She's been giving me glory. This is not a works-based message, my friend. This is reminding you that he's worthy. Yeah. And then he takes notice. Yeah. He takes notice how you respond. Like whenever you're feeling downcast, he takes notice that you that you came into his house. Yes, you. Hallelujah. And that and that you raised your hands to him, even though you might not have felt like it when you first walked in. And then and then when he when you moved towards him, he moved a little bit towards you. And then hallelujah, you started worshiping him even a little bit more. And the next thing you know, oh, you were feeling his he wants you to know that he takes notice when you worship. He wants you to know that he remembers your sacrifices. Nothing is going unnoticed with the Lord. He sees what we offer unto him. Amen? It says in verse 5, We will rejoice in your salvation, Lord. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. I love that word banner. It's really a flag. I had some different words in there. I was thinking... You know, look, the flag, the banner of the Lord. It's where you, and I've shared this before, and I don't mean to over-preach this, cause, but I can remember one time, I've said it before, I was running a 5K, 
and they had a flag and it was the end of the race. And that flag was kind of flapping in the wind and it was far away, but I could see it. That's just an illustration because I could care less about the flag. <laughs> I could care less about the flag at the end of the race. But I do care about this to understand that there's a banner, there's a name for him. His name is Jehovah Nisi. Yes. And he is the banner. He is the war cry. He is the place that we gather under. He is the flag that we look towards. He is the reminder that's up and off in the distance of what we do, why we get up, why we come to church, why we worship the Lord, why we carry the presence of the Lord with us in everyday life and everywhere that we go. Because like we said last on, on Wednesday, the, he said, as long as I live, as sure as I live, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. God's glory is going to fill this earth. Yeah. On the other side, like Miss Matilda said, he is going to rule and reign on the throne of David, and his glory is going to fill the earth. But I can promise you something, saints. He's looking for a Christian today that will rise up and say, fill me up, Holy Spirit. Take me to the schoolyard. Take me to Walmart. Take me to wherever you're going to bring me. And let the glory of your presence that is in me come out of me and give hope to somebody else. Yes. They got people that are hurting out. People are hurting. Yes, are. How you know so much, preacher? My, my family's been touched. I've been touched by pain. I still experience pain. I cry out every day for my children. What, what, what do you propose I do? Because, I, because it's, it seems like I've, I've been knocking. Have I really been knocking that long? Not really. How long you got to knock? But I mean, what do you do? You gonna, well, I've been knocking for the last, I don't know how many years. I think I'm just tired of knocking. I think I'm just going to quit knocking. I mean, you're not answering it the way that I want you to answer it, so I guess I'm just going to quit knocking. No! Keep on knocking. You don't quit knocking. You don't quit asking. You keep on seeking. That's right. And hopefully we're seeking. There's been times in my walk, I'm going to be transparent with you because I'm only here to try to help you. But no matter what people think, no matter what people say, no matter what you may even think in your own mind, all I desire to do is to help people. Yes. All I want to do is to help people walk with the Lord because he's called me to do such a thing. And I'm here to tell you right now, the enemy will get up in your head and he will even turn you against your own family. Yes. He will get you so frustrated you won't even be praying for your own children. That's right. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us. That we would not get so irritated that we wouldn't even pray for our own children. Because they weren't doing it the way that we expected them to do it. Lord, help us. And when it's all said and done, he said in verse 6, Now know I that the Lord saves his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven. You know in the New Testament, you're the anointed of God. In the New Testament, now that you have been saved and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, I want to tell you what the Word of God says about you. You are the anointed of God. The anointing represents the oil of his presence. When you got saved, the oil of his presence came to live on the inside of you. You are the anointed of God. Amen. And God has called you with an anointing, and he desires for you not just to come to church and to just sit down inside of a church. Amen. Praise God when you show up to church. Hallelujah, right? I mean, no, really, we could have just sat and watched something on TV, or we could have watched a preacher on TV. We could have watched a good preacher on TV. But praise God, we got up and came to the house of the Lord, and that's a good thing. But he wants us to do even more than that. Oh, I'm not ready for that preacher. Okay, well, at least you got here. But he wants more. What do you mean? What does he want? He wants people filled with his glory, filled with his anointing, to go outside these walls and to bring his glory and his anointing yeah. to people that are out there hurting. And he wants you and I to believe that and for you and I to allow him to do that. But you are the anointed of the Lord. I want you to know that. Look around the room a little bit. Kind of like look and try to make eye contact with at least one person. I know that makes you feel weird. Okay, you don't have to do it if you don't really want to. I'm trying to make a point. Okay, I'll make eye contact with Ron. Make eye contact with me. I see you, Hunter. Can't hide from me. I thought you would really do it. Yeah, you can. You did a good job. This is the point that I'm trying to make with all that. When you made eye contact with somebody, that's the anointed of the Lord. Watch how you treat the anointed of the Lord. Oh, all the preachers want to stand behind it. Don't touch the anointing. 
Lord, help us. We won't get into that right now. No, you're all the anointed of the Lord. Lord, help the preacher if he touched the anointed. I'm trying to make you, I'm trying to help you. You got to be careful about how you treat the anointed of the Lord. And so I want you to know that you're the, you know, because look, you got to remember that because sometimes family members, people that you thought were brothers or friends, they may come against you. People may secretly and maliciously want to see you fall. I don't know why people get that kind of stuff all jammed up in their heart, but they do. How you know so much, preacher? <laughs> they may feel animosity in their heart towards you. Say one thing till you say something else to somebody else behind your back. But the God of Jacob will hear in the day of your trouble, and he will deliver you. If the God before you, who can be against you? Watch it, my friend. Watch how you treat the anointed of the Lord. Watch how you talk about the anointed of the Lord behind their back. Watch your motives. Watch your heart. Guard your heart against the bitter seeds of evil that will try to come in. Hallelujah. The king said, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of our Lord. Man, is that not good? Man, that's good. Remember the name of Jesus. I put it in here. I had no way to know they were going to sing that song. They never sung that song before. I actually added it this morning. I had all these other names, and I went to the top, and I put Yahweh. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yahweh. Remember the name, the existing one, the omnipotent one, the one that was so holy they couldn't even call him by Yahweh. They had to call him Jehovah because he's so holy. Jehovah Rapha, he is your healer. What kind of healing do you need this morning? Do you need a healing in your physical body? He still heals physical bodies today. He'll heal your emotions. You've been hurt. Somebody did you wrong. He will heal you. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is Jehovah Shalom. He will bring peace. Peace into your life. Instead of chaos and confusion, the Holy Spirit will show up and it brings, like Paul said, a peace that surpasses yeah. us. Doesn't even make any sense. Yeah. The situation hasn't changed. Peace. The Prince of Peace. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Jehovah Shammah. Yeah. His presence is with us. Yeah. Yeah. They call you will call him Emmanuel, for he is God yeah. with us. Jehovah Shammah. His presence is with us. Hallelujah. He's with us. He's with us. He's in us. And he's with us right now. Jehovah Sink. He is our righteousness. He's your righteousness, my friend. I don't, listen, it doesn't matter how much you come to church. It doesn't matter how many ministries you're involved in. It doesn't matter how much you read your Bible. Please read your Bible. It doesn't matter how many hours you pray. Please pray. He is your righteousness. When you learn to allow him to clothe you in his righteousness. People begin to change you because from that righteous position, now the Holy Spirit will begin to pour into you. The Holy Spirit dispenses something so beautiful, it's called grace. Grace changes things. It's a catalyst. Grace of God changes things. It empowers you to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Grace is an inside job. The Holy Spirit wants to work on the inside. When you feel those hurts, when you think those thoughts, when you hear that stuff and the enemy's coming against and you know it's not right, the Holy Spirit wants to come in and he wants to heal you yeah. on the inside. Yeah. He is your righteousness. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's our banner. We need to start putting some kind of banners or something up in here. I don't know. Something that says something. About Jesus. I've been trying, I've been trying to get some help. I need y'all help. We gotta get something up on these walls and remind us about Jesus. He's Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. Hallelujah. He provided a lamb for Abraham. And then I got into this. He's El Shaddai. You were saying that the other night. El Shaddai Adonai. El Shaddai Adonai. El Shaddai is the all sufficient. What do you need? It was a weird teaching. Mr. Paul used to, well, I'm not even going to say it. But it was good. It had to do with nourishment. He's all sufficient. He has everything that you need. His, the idea is that it's the full breast of him. 
He's got, he's got what you need that you cannot out, you cannot re, deplete him of his, of his, of his nourishment. You can't deplete him of what he has to offer. He has more than enough. The word of God says in the book of Romans that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. There's not enough sin upon the earth to exhaust the grace of God. People might feel that way. It might look that way, but listen to you and I, we don't have to live that way. You and I have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, and you and I have access to grace. Some of you might get tired of hearing all that. Some of you might get ready to take a nap, but let me tell you, when I talked to them guys in the Centerville jail, they were awake because they need some grace moving in their life. They hadn't been sucking on a... Uh, a, 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 a They hadn't been sucking on a bottle for so long that they've been exposed to the word of God for so long that they start taking it for granted. They in a bind. They in a hurting. Can they walk out of there and still go back to what? Yes, they can. But right now, God's got their attention. Right now, God's got their attention and they're in the midst of a desperate situation. And some of us, and especially young people, be careful, young people. Please be careful, young people, if you've been raised under the word of God. Please never let the love of God leave your heart. Please never take for granted the love of God, the word of God. Because sometimes we've been around it for so long, we've been inundated by it so much that we start to take it for granted that our heart gets hard like, yeah, I'm tired of hearing that preacher. I done been here. No, 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 no. Please don't let your heart start to feel that way, young person, old person, whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you come from. Please don't let our heart start taking for granted. He's El Shaddai. He's all sufficient. He's omnipotent. He's Adonai. Lord God. Abraham called him that. Lord God, you are my master. I am your servant. Hallelujah. What would you have me to do? He's a good God, right? Life as a Christian would be so much simpler if there was a period at the end of that saying. What saying? Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Wouldn't it be simpler, life simpler, if there was like punctuation? I mean, literally in the translation of punctuation. I'm, I'm trying to say like, no, really, like spiritually speaking, faith-wise, Right? Not even just necessarily a period. What about an exclamation point, right? I mean, I'm trying to say, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of our God, exclamation point, period. Yeah. Done. I'm going to remember the name of my God. You can come against me with whatever you're coming against me, but exclamation point, period. I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. But, oh God, we your people, we repent. I repent. I repent for myself. I repent for all of your people for all time. Oh, that's biblical, my friend. Daniel, after those 70 years of captivity near the end, Lord, I repent for your people. I repent for all your people of all times when we place a semicolon, a comma, a dash, dash, a comma, and a coordinating conjunction, comma, and, comma, but. No. We will remember the name of the Lord our God. Isaiah said, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit. Spirit, that they may add sin to sin. They walk to go down into Egypt and have, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves instead in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. That's Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. The NASB version says this. Woe to my people who execute a plan, but not mine. They make an alliance, but not of my spirit, and they add sin to sin. You know, sometimes we make alliances in our lives. 
We can make a lot of alliances in a lot of different ways, right? Look, Isaiah prophesies as Israel lives in rebellion. They, they're, they're no longer really serving God, but they are going through the rituals of religion. It's kind of like a Christian in church that he hears the word, but he keeps living in sin. People in the world, in the church, they live like one day it's not all coming to an end. Like there won't be any judgment to face. Whether it's a great white throne judgment or whether it's a judgment seat of Christ, there is going to be a day when it's all said and done, when grace is going to run out, when there will be no more talking. Even though Isaiah said, even though the Lord said in Isaiah chapter 1, come let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be made white like snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can be made like wool. Come let us reason. He's been reasoning with people. He's been reasoning with his people. I, I, I can't help myself, but I got a, I got a question. I feel like I'm partly responsible for your soul. I feel, re no, I feel really responsible for your soul. And, and for us to understand. And listen, if you're good with the Lord, then you're probably feeling good right now. If you're not good with the Lord, you might not be feeling good right now. But guess what? We can get good with the Lord. Hallelujah. He's wanting us to be right with him. Amen. That's right. Much of the church world well, nowadays, they don't want to hear all that. Israel had been in sin. Judah was in sin. Their sin will result in bondage. Anytime a child of God finds themselves in sin or any time they have a problem, they should go to God. Amen? Amen. No one else, nothing else. Okay, if you have a friend that's going to lead you to God, if you have a friend that's going to lead you back to God, if you have a spouse that's going to lead you back to God, if you have a pastor that's going to lead you back to God, in the truth of God, hallelujah. That's good. Amen. But I need you to understand that if you find yourself in there, that you do have an advocate. My little children, John says this, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it. My little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth. Is not in him. First John chapter three verses six through seven. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Yeah. You don't know who could be sinning in the congregation. No, really. So as a as a pastor, I'm just asking you: if you're sitting in the congregation, right, and you you know what you know what may be in your life, what might not be in your life, and here I am, here I am, the, the preacher, partially responsible for I will be held accountable for. I speak from this desk. I can promise you I will be held accountable for what I speak from this desk. And so the question is, is that what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to soften it up? Are we supposed to dilute it to the sense that people don't get to hear what the truth said? This is the word of the Lord, my friend. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. It is not, it is not possible for the child of God who has the spirit of God living on the inside of them to continue a perpetual life of sin without being at some point in time convicted of the Holy Spirit. But then this is the, this is the tricky part. Sometimes when we don't yield or listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, something happens to our conscience. It becomes seared as with a hot iron. And then we don't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The way that we used to feel the conviction. Yeah. How do you know so much? I've experienced. I've experienced not listening to the voice of God and my conscience becoming seared and thinking that I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Amen. Why do you think I talked about justification by faith in the way that I did about a blanket? We become comfortable, and the word of the Lord says that we're to fear Him, we're to tremble. At his holy word, he is holy. The Holy Spirit is holy. But this is the thing. He's also given us the grace and the strength that we need in order to be able to live our lives in such a way where we're pleasing to him. Yeah. 
That's the beauty of what the cross really represents, that Jesus paid the penalty of our sin, but also in what he did, it releases grace into our life to strengthen us. Sometimes maybe you feel like you not you don't feel like you can go on if you can put this one up there. Haley, I like this scripture because it's got the one place that I've seen this word in the New Testament. Hebrews 2 verse 18. I like this King James word. Hebrews 2 verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, secure, succor. It's not secure, secor. Them that are tempted. What does that word mean? If you look at another translation, it means to give aid. He experienced testing and temptation by evil upon the earth while he was here. He is also able to give aid to those that are experiencing. So if you find yourself in the midst of a situation, maybe I'm just talking to people on the video. You find yourself in the midst of a situation that you keep stumbling, keep falling, don't know what to do, you don't feel good about it, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is still dealing with your heart. You have an advocate with the Father, his name is Jesus Christ, and he will support you. He will give aid to you. In the midst of your pain, in the midst of your heartache, in the midst of your trial, he will minister to you. If you will call upon his name. And if you will trust in his name, and if you will hope in him and trust in him, hallelujah, if you will not go down to Egypt and make a covering for yourself, if you will not go down to Egypt and find another alliance of some sort, but instead will trust in the Lord. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. See, the word that the Lord gave me this morning started with the thought of alliances. I'm not going to lie to you over the last week or so. Some various things have, I, I, I was, I, I experienced some various things. And I was in prayer about some of that stuff. And whenever I did, the, that passage of scripture came in my heart. Woe to, woe to the rebellious children. They go to Egypt and they cover sin with sin. They make it. They place a covering for themselves. They place a covering for themselves, but it's not a covering of the Lord. They're finding something else to cover themselves. Now, we used to always preach this, well, we don't have to be part of the denomination because we don't need, and you don't have to be part of the denomination. <laughs> the Lord is our covering, but let me tell you something. I used to preach that real hard. Let me say something to you. You need to be praying for your pastor. Because I'm going to promise you that what I believe today is a whole lot different than what I believed last year. I didn't really feel like your spirituality had a whole lot interconnected to me. The Lord has shown me that I was wrong. You fathers, y'all better wake up. Y'all might be awake. I hope you're awake. You better wake up, man of God. Because you're the covering in your house. Spirituality is coming through you. You are the head of the home. And we better wake up, my man. We better wake up. We better get a warrior's heart. We better get along with the Lord. We better cry out to God and say, Lord, make me the man of God that you call me to be. So in a sense, there's a covering like that. But in the end, if your pastor ain't bringing you to Jesus to let him be your covering, your pastor ain't worth his weight and salt. And in the end, if the husband or the man of God is not doing what he's supposed to do, Lord, help him. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And I've been on both, been in both of those positions. So the word of the Lord gave me this idea of these alliances, coverings. You know, in my mind, prayer is one of the most powerful things that Christians can do. Just follow my little train of thought here. Prayer is one of the most powerful things Christians can do. And when we consider our own lives, we can probably admit that there have been seasons in our lives where we probably weren't praying as much as what we should. We neglected the, the privilege. Just like Miss Matilda was talking about the privilege of worshiping the king, the privilege of experiencing the presence of the Lord. Many times we'll also neglect the privilege of being able to pray. I mean, what I'm trying to say, no, that's a privilege. <laughs> it's a, oh, and it's a privilege for me to have to get up early in the morning. It's a privilege to, to even the thought that the king of the universe yes. would hear your prayer. Amen. Yes. 
Yes. Amen? Yes. Last, on Wednesday, they were singing that song. You tore the veil. You made a way. When you said that it is done. The veil's been torn. Yes. The veil's been torn signifying that entry into the Holy yes. of Holies has been done. The veil's been torn signifying that you and I, when we enter into worship, can expect to experience his presence. The veil's been torn signifying that when you and I bring our petitions before the Lord, we can expect that our prayers will not fall on deaf ears. That is a privilege. That means to me and you that we can bring our needs before the Lord. Jesus chose a parable of a wicked judge, right? In Luke 18, you, you don't have to turn there, but look, he spoke a parable to this end. Men ought always to pray and not be faint. We ought always to pray and not be faint. And he tells about a story of a town where there was a wicked judge and he could care less about justice. And there was a woman that needed help against her adversary. And she came to him. And she kept coming to him. And he says, I could care less about justice. I could care less about avenging her. But if I don't do something, she's going to come to me with her continual coming. And she's going to end up wearying me. <laughs> Hear what the unjust judge says. Then shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. When he comes back, will he find us praying? When, listen, I didn't even have time to look up that word cry right now, but let that be your homework. This is an easy little homework assignment. Write it down in your little notebook if you got it. Or make a middle note. Cry. Let me look that up in my strong. I'll be surprised if it doesn't tell you a great clamor and boisterousness. I'll be surprised to tell you that the Jesus you serve. In the days of his flesh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, he prayed with tears and loud cries. So let them pray in silence. Let them pray out loud. Just let them pray. And let them not grow faint in their prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pray, pray, pray. Don't grow faint. You know, there's a lot of things that we should be praying about, right? Our marriage, our spouse, our children, our job, the church we go to. I mean, I'm just talking. There might be somebody watches our videos. There are people that watch our videos, and you go to another church somewhere. Can I just encourage you to pray for your pastor? Can I encourage you to pray for your church? Yes. Yes. Whoever you are, where your pastor will appreciate if you pray for him and if you pray for your church. There's so much more we should pray for. Our nation, our friends, the rest of our family. Christians should pray all the time about everything. And if that makes you feel irritated in your spirit because you don't pray, I'm not sorry. Get your heart right and what I just said will make you feel better. Because we're supposed to be praying. The people of God are supposed to be praying to people. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find it. Knock and it shall be opened to you. I'm not going to stop praying. By the grace of God, I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep on asking. I'm going to keep on knocking. And even if, like Abraham, I don't see the promises. Oh, Lord, here we go. Even if, like Abraham, I don't see the promises of God on this side of glory, I want to know this, that when he comes back, he sees Matt Abair as a person, and he finds faith. Yeah. Faith in the God of the universe, faith in the God, the only one that can change my situation. Paul said in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Whatever your definition of praying without ceasing is, it's probably safe to say that most of God's people are probably not praying as much as they should. I'm not saying you're not praying. If you're a prayer warrior, hallelujah. I'm trying to make a point that most of God's people are probably not praying the way that we should. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, I did not say they're not talking. Christians, I mean. I didn't say that they're not talking. They're, they're talking just a lot of the time they're talking to someone else besides God. Israel planned to sit down and talk to Egypt. God saw what they were doing. They were about to make the world or Egypt their cover. You know, the world has ways of getting through things. What was the beginning of my question for the 
start of my message, in everyday life situations, how do we go about comparing spiritual things with spiritual things? And we said a right understanding of God's word mixed with the discerning help of the Holy Spirit. God's word says that we ought to be praying. God's word says that we ought to be listening to his voice and not the world. God's word says that we ought to be making, if we're making alliances, it ought to not be with Egypt, my friend. Right. Who is Egypt? Egypt is the world. Where's the world? They buy the water cooler. <laughs> they, end up, they end up in the hallway at school when I go to get my books at the locker. Dude, I remember high school years. I don't know, y'all still got lockers? I don't know if y'all still have lockers. I had lockers. There's a whole lot of shenanigans going on in the lockers, bro. Whole lot of mess going on in the hallways of the school. Everybody got their own little thing going on. I remember it wasn't that long ago because I was one of the messiest ones causing my trouble trying to get, oh yeah, let's stir up some trouble. Let's make life rough for these people. Thank you, Jesus, for changing. Yes, Lord. I couldn't get away with nothing. I was too loud. <laughs> I didn't say they're not talking. Israel planned to sit down. They were going to sit down with Egypt. The word for alliance, more specifically the word covering, used in the King James, has multiple, multiple times it describes a molten image. I thought that was interesting. It can also be a woven fabric that you would use to cover yourself. But it also describes a molten image like a false god. So anything, really, this is how I'm going to bring this over into the New Testament, anything really that gets between you and God could be a cover. Gets between you and the will of God could be a cover, right? So people are putting something before God. The covering is something that they're using for protection or comfort, support, even advice instead of God. It could be a multitude of things, right? I'm just going to throw some stuff out there. It could be A-A-N-A, Al-Anon. It could be a psychiatrist. It could be a counselor. It could be a medicine, it could be a job, it could be a church, it could be a pastor, it could be a spouse, it could be a friend, it could be a friend at work, it could be a spouse or a friend that even meant well. The point is you're talking to them instead of God. Oh, so I can't talk to my friend or my spouse? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we never talk to friends or spouses, I'm saying... It becomes a slippery slope when alliances and coverings are trusted instead of God. When I speak to earthlings instead of God. That's the point that I'm trying to make. I'm going to read this to you, right? This is just a thought I had over the last couple of weeks. And now you tell me if this doesn't make sense, if you can give me just a little bit of attention. I'm not going to go that long today, I promise. This amazes me. Five different Christians filled with the Spirit have read the Bible for years, and all five have a differing opinion about a specific topic. Does that sound like legit to you? Yes. No, no, really. I'm just asking. Y'all yeah. been in these situations, right? This is real life stuff right here, okay? They have a differing opinion, and each will leave the situation convinced that they are right and others are wrong. Yeah. Right? Yes. Okay. So this is just a speculation. I'm just trying to figure it out. Is the reason that they believe that is because they pray and hear from God? That's what they're thinking in their mind, right? But I just said that all five of them pray. I just said that all five of them have read the Bible. I just said that all five of them believe that they discern from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so if that be the case, the only answer that I can see must be that I'm more spiritual. Or you're more spiritual than that. Or thus three that agree with one another are more spiritual than the two that disagree. I mean, that's the only thing I can say. But what about a spirit of humility? Where, where does that come into the fold? I mean, Jesus, who knew all truth, at least was in the process of learning all truth and had the Holy Spirit in him, and hey, he was truth. Humbled himself. Yes. Yet we, who belong to him, leave that situation thinking we right and everybody else is wrong. So what about a teachable spirit that says, 
maybe I could be wrong about this situation, or better yet, maybe all of us have some elements right, some elements that need to be tweaked or fixed, and we all need to keep seeking him and humbling self, and when we do, we all may get closer to his truth. Oh, hallelujah, I can feel the Lord on that. We might be on to something, church. The answer is to humble self, have a teachable spirit, talk less to earthlings, talk more to God, and everything must be aligned with the written Word. And let me tell you something. There's a whole lot to this written word. Amen. You, you think you found one scripture that makes your point, and I could probably find three or four that actually contradict what you're saying. And that doesn't mean that the word of God contradicts itself. The word of God's trying to give us an understanding that there's spirit within this word. And if you take it all together and you put it in and you shake it up, then the truth is going to come out. And the wisdom of truth, the spirit of truth will speak truth to you. He will lead you and he will guide you. But I can promise you this. It's not God's will for you to form an alliance, even with your bestie that you might go to church with and by the water cooler, sit there and have a conversation about what you think is right and everything else that is going wrong. And you talk about your brother or your sister behind the back. It's not right. It's the spirit of gossip. I'm not even, I even planning on getting into even using that word. And, and listen, it does not promote unity. It promotes disunity. Teachable spirit, humble spirit will allow the Holy Spirit to, to move on us to give us greater revelation. But whenever we walk around here thinking we got it all figured out, we're messing ourselves up. What is the covering or alliance that you might have placed over yourself? It could be anything that you have in place or position between you and God that prevents you from going directly to God. Back to the things we should pray about. What about church and family? Let's just talk about that. What happens when something good, like a friend, more specifically a brother or sister in the Lord, I go to them to talk to them about my marriage? I'm going through some things in my marriage. <coughs> and... Maybe they agree with me in my frustrations. Have you ever been in a situation like that before? Y'all, I know y'all getting tired already. It's only 1133. Y'all, 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 y'all ever been in a situation like that before where y'all frustrated in y'all's yes. marriage? Yes. And you and you go talk to someone and you're talking to a Christian. Yep. And, and and I'm just I'm gonna pretend not I don't pretend I'm a girl, but I'm just saying, like the girl, the girl might be like. Girl, I know what you're talking about. Because that, my husband did the same thing to me. And I'm telling you right now, the Lord don't want you to have to live in all that. That's a spirit of Jezebel right there. That's a lying spirit of rebellion. That is causing you, you about to verge on rebellion against the word of God. But that's a sister in the Lord. She wouldn't do that to me. Let me tell you something. That sister in the Lord right now, she did not lead you back to God. She did not lead you back to the word of God. She led you somewhere to make your flesh feel good. You were looking for an answer, and she was right there to give it to you. An opinion, not based upon the word of the living God. That's a dangerous, slippery slope. Yes, sir. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Because you see, what the Lord wants to do is the Lord wants to minister. See, there's a scripture that talks about in the book of Hebrews this. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord. See, the Lord was telling Israel in Isaiah chapter 30, this was his answer. His answer to them was this. You've rebelled against me, but I love you. I'm going to chasten your sin. You do understand that sin... Sin is all, can always be forgiven. He's always, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, hallelujah, pray, he will heal their way. He is a God of love. He's a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. He's just waiting. He's, he's got his ear like this. He's like, I'm just waiting. And, oh, Lord, half the time we're over there, like, in the midst of the turmoil. We're in the pit. We're in the chaos. We're in the frustration. And he's, He's like, I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm just waiting for a little whisper so that I can come and I can minister to you. No, a genuine whisper. Yeah. Not like just a little half-hearted whisper. Not like in your mind. Like we pretend that God don't know what's in our heart. Now think about that. Like who are we monkeying around with the Lord? 
We're like, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. And, and the whole time we're like, if you just get me out of this moment right here, then I can, and I'll, you know, no, you already got it planned out. Right, right. The Lord ain't. This God's real, man. God, God formed the heaven and the earth and all that in them is. God is real. We can't trick him. I'm talking to you about stuff I know I've done in my own heart before. <clears throat> Praying that God will help me, but in reality, not really knowing if I really, really, really want him to help because I kind of like where I am. Mm -hmm. That's a mess. Yeah, and I can find somebody to agree with. And that's an alliance and a covering that the Lord is not okay. Amen. You go searching for him, you'll find him there out there. They'll help you. So you think. They'll help you transgress the word of the Lord. Now you're going to open up a whole nother can of worms, my friend. You added sin to sin. I'm trying to help you. We can take this scenario into the church. Well, I'm just saying. I'm not saying this is going on. I'm talking to you. Out there in video land and I'm trying to help your pastor. I don't like the way pastor does this. I believe that that is wrong. What do you think about it? Yeah, I kind of agree with you about that. Let's see what he says over there. And she said, we all agree that pastor is wrong about this. And surely we're right because look how many of us agree with each other. We formed an alliance. There's a bunch of us, so we must be right. And we pray and we hear from God. So dot, dot, dot. Right? In your experience in the world, when things aren't going the way you want them to, what is the normal course of action that you have moved towards? Say, for instance, you go to work or even a family get together and you're around people that you're familiar with and something is heavy on your heart. What is it that you're likely to do at that moment? I've seen it too many times. We get around the table and we start talking. We unload it. And it's understandable. I'm not trying to tell you that I don't understand why it happens because I've done it too. It's not like I'm innocent completely in this endeavor. I'm just trying to make a point. It's heavy on our heart. But you know what's, you know what's interesting is, is that I personally feel like I'm a very approachable guy. So if it is going on in our church, I'm not saying that it is completely. I know that there's always some things going to go on in the church. You can't fix everything. You can't preach it, everything. But you're supposed to preach it. And I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would move in each and every one of our hearts and in our lives. Amen? Okay. But I feel like I'm a pretty approachable guy. I'm just saying. Like, if somebody was willing to say, you know, Pastor, I don't really completely agree with your decision on this. Can you explain it to me? I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. I really would. Now, we might not leave there agreeing with one another. But, but if you do come with me, to me. All I'm trying to say is this. If you do come to me, come with more than just an opinion. Come with your, come with biblical precedence or your, you come with the scripture. Right. And then, and then what we'll do is we'll discuss the scripture. Amen. And in the end, we still may not agree. Amen. Right? Because, but, but there's right and there's wrong and the Holy Spirit's still in the midst of it all. At least now we discussed it and and then you didn't, you or nor I, hopefully, didn't add sin to sin. Right, right. Meaning, you know, because so, I could do it too. I could be like, I heard such and such about so and so, and what do you think about this? Look what they said about me. Look what they did to me. And and all I'm trying to say is, is that is the Lord moving? Is the Lord happy with that? Are we learning to grow in Christ and to mature that way if we keep doing it the way that the world does it? Yeah, it's good. I, I mean, I'm going to be real with you. I've shared this before, and I know, Danielle, she may not remember it, but I, before I was really, I would say, a true, like a Christian that really wanted to hear from, like I went to church and I paid my tithes. I'll tell you that. And I, and, and I wanted to go to church. And I worked with a bunch of women in, in a hospital setting. I mean, there were other men, but we were definitely outnumbered. 98% women, 2% men, at least in this ICU unit. <laughs> and I would watch these women treat each other, dude. They were rough on each other, like, <laughs> like claws. Man. Like, but they liked me, I guess, because I was a boy. I don't know. Thank you, Jesus, that they were nice to me, because I sure enough wouldn't want to have to take with one of them girls. I'm like, whoa, baby. And I can remember one time, I, we weren't happy in our marriage. Or I wasn't happy. Whatever my problem was. And I was talking to this other nurse. And I was, I was, you know, they tell you you're not supposed to do that kind of thing. By the way, just to let you know. 
And I was talking to her about that. Well, I'm over here talking to the world. And I'm not even a real spiritual guy at this time. I mean, I go to church, like I said, and I tell her, yeah, I'm just not real happy. I don't even know what I want to her. You know what that girl said? It's okay, Daddy. If you're not happy, you can leave. Ain't you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? Dude, I was not, and I wasn't even, I was sneaking beer on the slick. I was dipping about a can, and I have to dip it. And that is sin, because it's destroying your body. It's got a demon spirit connected to it. It's called addiction. It's sin. Let's call it what it is. Anything that has a demon spirit of addiction connected to it is sin. Let's quit monkeying around and worrying about we're going to make everybody mad. Let's ask the Lord to set us free from these things so that we can walk in strength and in victory and in liberty so that we can hear the voice of the Lord. It was sin then. It's sin today, and I was full of it. And I'm over here trying to hear from the Lord, and now I go and I approach this girl right here, and she's like, it's okay, Maddie. You can be happy because, because everybody in the world wants to be happy. It's okay if two people love each other even though they're of the same sex. Everybody wants to be happy. It's okay if a boy wants to be a girl and a girl wants to be a boy because everybody wants to be happy. But they're not happy. That's not going to make them happy. That's going to add sin to sin. Why are you talking like that, preacher? Because it's the truth. And immediately when she said that, the Holy Spirit said, look at you. You're going to listen to the counsel of the world. Wow. All I can tell you is, Christian, you don't want to listen to the counsel of the world. Singers, musicians, would you come forward and lead us in a song that we could worship our king? Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. David was about to go to war at a time. He knew what to do, and he wrote. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Yes. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I want to remember the name of the yes. Lord my God. I want to trust him. I want to live for him. Amen. I want to give him glory and honor. I want to thank you this morning for coming to the house of God and giving glory to your king. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe he was pleased with and listen, we can go out the same way we came. We can worship Him. Let's worship Him. Yeah. And if you need prayer, the altars are open. Amen. Hallelujah.